Hello, this is Dr. A. So let's take some time and look at uh, the evaluation of pregnancy in the clinical labs. This is chapter 26 of Larson's Clinical Chemistry. So um, pregnancy um, occurs when an egg is fertilized by a sperm. So uh, ovaries in a female will release one ovum per month. So every month um, per cycle, there's an egg that's released. Um, and if a sperm can travel all the way up to where the egg is in the fallopian tube, then this is where fertilization will occur. And then it takes about a week uh, after fertilization, the egg is going to be dividing in the fallopian tube and just tumbling down, stays about the same size, um, and it will go and implant in the uterine wall about <clears throat> an average about seven days after fertilization. Then when, once it implants, and that is technically really the beginning of you know, the pregnancy, the signals that the body is going to know that pregnancy has occurred. Uh, the chorionic villi will start implanting in the uterine wall, and that will eventually develop into a placenta, which attaches the fetus and, um, you know, to the, the mom and then the umbilical cord to the uterus. Um, so... Um, it provides, the placenta provides nutrients to the ba baby and helps remove waste and helps produce hormones to maintain the pregnancy. Uh, and uh, amniotic fluid is a fluid that is going to be in the amniotic site that is developing around the baby also. So these are, again, quick review of all of this. So a little bit about pregnancy and hormones. So uh, the hormone that starts to be produced when the egg implants in the uterine lining is HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, and its job is to stimulate that progesterone production from the corpus luteum. Uh, and so that's the signal, if you will, that your body's looking for is this HCG release, uh, and so that uh, progesterone production will continue to happen. The progesterone's job is to suspend menstruation, so no periods, no bleeding, no nothing, and to maintain pregnancy, especially early on until um, the placenta itself can produce enough hormones to continue maintaining the pregnancy. Uh, human placental lactogen is going to modify the metabolic state of the mom during pregnancy to facilitate energy supply to the fetus. So really when a mom is pregnant, it's really important that she takes care of getting enough nutrients because in the end, the baby is going to be getting all the nutrients, and then mom could be left depleted of nutrients. The uh, Again, the three estrogen hormones that are made uh, in the body are estradiol, estriol, and estrone. Estradiol really being the primary one for the reproductive cycle. Estriol is the primary one that's produced. Uh, in pregnancy, and estrone is uh, biologically active throughout life. So um, the some of the main job, for example, of estradiol is going to build up that endometrial layer and uh, the uterine uh, growth, but then estriol also is going to do uh, some of that in uterine growth and then prep for labor and stuff. So, so it has, there are some very specific roles to estriol that are related to pregnancy. Uh, amniotic fluid uh, provides a proper environment for the development of the fetus and maintains a constant temperature. It helps transport nutrients and electrolytes into the fetal circulation. The amniotic fluid volume varies um, throughout the, the pregnancy as the baby is growing, etc. Um, the phospholipids that can be detected in the amniotic fluid will reflect lung maturity, and so this could be important if a physician is considering an early delivery of a baby. Um, you know, sometimes if the lungs are not mature enough, they can, if the baby can stay inside the mama for a little bit longer, it's better. Uh, so we can do lecithin and sphingomyelin uh, testing with their ratio, as well as phosphatidylglycerol. Those can all be used to assess fetal lung maturity. Uh, and then the meconium is the first bowel movement that the baby has after being born, uh, and it is obviously partly amniotic fluid and other things. Uh, so it's first passive and exit of whatever's in its bowels. So the lab confirmation of pregnancy is by the detection of the beta subunit of HCG. We can do this in serum or urine, and it can be qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative meaning positive or negative. One of these little guys, pregnant, not pregnant, right? Or quantitative, we actually get a number. So, um, most physicians, if the qualitative is um, you know, positive, then they would want to know the specific HCG level. 
uh, to ensure it is rising appropriately and to aid again in determining how far along the woman might be, which week she might be in. Quantitative assays are usually performed on an immunoassay analyzer or one of the big analyzers that has immunoassay capabilities. Uh, and this hormone was going to peak at 100,000 international units per meal, uh, and it peaks at the end of the first trimester, and then uh, it starts to go down some. Um, and so, yeah, pregnancy is beta HCG. So let's look at Julie. So she's 25 years old. Um, she's pregnant. She goes to a physician for a first prenatal care visit. Her provider orders a prenatal lab work. So she, he's going to do a, a glucose uh, urinalysis, so basically glucose dipstick electrolytes, um, an RPR test with syphilis, the torch, titer, which is tox checking for toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, HSV, and HIV, vaginal cultures, and a type and screen to see what blood type mama is. Her fasting blood glucose level is 140. Uh, what should a provider order, order next and what disease should he suspect? So 140 for glucose, uh, and this would be for blood glucose, obviously. Uh, is going is high is elevated. Uh, you definitely don't want anything above uh, 100, especially being fasting. So if you remember your diabetes lesson, this is in the diabetic ranges. So then, what would you think here? Um, she has, and what do you think he needs? He, else, he would need to order. So, if we suspect diabetes with a high fasting glucose, probably want to do either A1C or quite commonly done for pregnant women, it's going to be oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and so then, which of these diseases of pregnancy would you suspect? Would you have eclampsia, gestational diabetes, pulp, or preeclampsia? Again, with a high blood sugar, we should probably discuss that it's going to be gestational diabetes. So let's look at the first complication of pregnancy, which is gestational diabetes. So uh, a glucose is um, usually drawn again, again after the prenatal one. If it's not, if it's not abnormal in the, the first prenatal workup, it's definitely drawn again at 24 between 24 and 28 weeks. So somewhere in that second term, and um, if it's abnormal, then a glucose tolerance test is done. Uh, sometimes, a lot of physicians actually do just do the glucose tolerance test in that window in that second trimester. And so it's usually a three hour one. And uh, the lady needs to come in fasting to do a fasting blood sugar. Then she drinks this glucose load. And then we do usually um, sometimes 30 minutes, but at least an hour, two hour, and three hour post load to see how the blood sugar uh, should go back down to normal. If, if it doesn't go back down to normal, then we can. Uh, suspect gestational diabetes. So uh, if two values uh, within this exceed normal, then the patient is considered positive for gestational diabetes. Many physicians will perform a one-hour postprandial glucose test on pregnant women to screen it for it, and that if that's elevated due to um, oral glucose tolerance test. So a one-hour postprandial glucose test just means an hour after they've eaten. If an hour after a person has eaten, their glucose is still high, then we can definitely suspect uh, a diabetes or gestational diabetes. Next complications can be ectopic pregnancy. So uh, this is when the fertilized egg implants outside of the uterus, usually implants in the fallopian tube. This could happen if there's something that's like blocking the egg from coming fully down the fallopian tube, some scar tissue or something like that. The symptoms are going to be Lower abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and cessation of menses. It can cause, it's usually, causes are damage to the fallopian tubes, usually from an infection uh, that could have happened way early on. And um, the diagnostic test um, would be uh, serial quantitative levels of HCG to confirm an ectopic pregnancy, and then monitored removal of the fertilized egg from the fallopian tube. If this is not addressed, it could be life-threatening because the fallopian tube can rupture. There can be a lot of bleeding going on. Uh, so it's important to diagnose this correctly. Next complication, hyperemesis gravidarum. So it's a severe form of nausea and vomiting. So this is beyond just a morning sickness that's just really annoying. Uh, this one is uh, accompanies also weight loss and ketosis. Um, there's uh, imbalance in acid base and electrolytes. Um, there's severe dehydration. There's nutritional deficits, etc. The best 
fix for that uh, is going to be um, IV fluid infusions. Symptoms are going to be nausea and vomiting, which again could initially think uh, morning sickness, but also fatigue, dizziness, depression, anxiety, uh, and it's just it's more than normal. Um, and one way, a quick way to check if this is what's going on is uh, a urine ketone test can be done and to pick up on ketosis. Um, the lab test is going to be UA, CBC, BMP, LFT, hepatitis, amylase, lactate, CSH, urine cultures, and of course ketones. Quickest way is on urine, you can do it on serum also. There are some medications to help control that, but infuse, like rehydrating the woman is very important giving more nutrients. Um, so why would, why would we see ketones in her urine? Is she diabetic? Is it an infection? Or is it really starvation? And so I'll let you take a guess on that, what you think it might be. So next complications can be preeclampsia. So um, this is uh, evidenced by high blood pressure of 160 to 110 or higher. And proteinuria would be three plus on two random specimens dipstick after the 20th week. So preeclampsia can be severe. Risk factors for preeclampsia are going to be being older than 40, being black, having a family history of preeclampsia, having chronic renal disease, chronic hypertension, diabetes, twins, or high BMI. The only treatment for preeclampsia is delivery of the baby, but of course, uh, the concern is then going to be, uh, are the baby's lungs mature enough? Um, if delivery is, delivery is considered before 37 weeks and after 32 weeks, then uh, again, lung maturity can be a concern and the, the mama can be given corticosteroids to help uh, speed up the maturing of the baby's lungs until the lungs can be mature and then hopefully the, the mom, um, the baby delivered so that uh, then when the baby is delivered, it fixes the preeclampsia. The um, lab test obviously is associated with that going to be a urine protein, a CBC, AST, ALT, serum uric acid level, and creatinine. And we definitely, again, lots of protein in the urine, um, but with some liver abnormalities and uh, elevated uh, uric acid and stuff and kidney issues. Next would be eclampsia. So uh, that is a complication of preeclampsia. Now, it is very rare in the United States because we have prenatal care and we usually can catch it as preeclampsia. Um, the eclampsia can lead to grand mal seizures and uh, even to into a coma and uh, cause intracranial hemorrhage. Um, it is usually associated with teen moms and mothers over 35 years uh, and totally associated with those who lack prenatal care. So this is a complication uh, in areas where there is no prenatal care and it is life-threatening. Another uh, life-threatening complication is HELP syndrome. So uh, it is a life-threatening manifestation of preeclampsia. And again, this is why we do deliver enzymes and CBC, et cetera. So uh, HELP stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. So those are the things that would be characteristic of the syndrome. Um, so you have thromb thrombocytopenia and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So there's all the, that, therefore the bleeding risk to hemorrhage and all of that. Um, usually um, this can happen between the 27th and 36th week of pregnancy and may occur after delivery. Symptoms are going to be right upper quadrant pain, malaise, nausea and vomiting, headache and jaundice. And uh, the expected lab results are going to be high LDH and high AST and ALT, with obviously low platelet count and evidence of hemolysis. Now into the fetal complications, neural tube defects are uh, abnormalities of the fetal central nervous system. So it's a failure of the neural tube to fuse. So you have several of them. You have spinal bifida, which is what we call the meningeal myelocele. The bottom of the neural tube does not fuse and like part of the spinal column like pokes out basically. Um, encephalocele is, I'm sorry, and encephalocele is a sac containing the brain and the membranes protrudes through an opening in the skull. And anencephaly is a lack of certain parts of the brain and skull. It just doesn't develop. Um, these all correlate with folic acid deficiency. Uh, and with um, AFP levels, which would be detected through the triple or quad screen. 
Next fetal complication is going to be Down syndrome. Um, in Down syndrome, there's an extra copy of the long arm of chromosome 21. Characteristics of Down syndrome are going to be mental retardation, hypotonia, conge congenital heart defects, um, usually the tetralogy of phallic, and a flat facial profile. For those, I discussed those on the heart chapter. Um, screening, uh, the triple and the quad screen uh, include uh, data about the risk of fetal Down syndrome. And if that screen is abnormal, then um, you really want to do further testing, usually a chromosomal analysis done by amniocentesis. Respiratory distress syndrome um, can be the result of preterm delivery. So delivering a baby whose lungs are not mature um, and um, lungs that aren't mature cannot produce enough pulmonary surfactant, which is what we're looking for when we test for fetal lung maturity. Um, and so what this pulmonary surfactant uh, help, help do is that when the baby takes their first breath in, because you know, they've had amniotic fluid in the lungs before that, it inflates all the alveoli, and then the surfactant keeps them from collapsing when the air pressure is low, so when the baby breathes out. And if without surfactant, what happens is the alveoli just stick closed, and so they collapse during exhalation. So then once they're stuck, it's hard to reinflate them. And so um, a baby will show hyperventilation with or without cyanosis, so they will be working like breathing fast and with labored breathing, they could be turning blue. Uh, they'll show nasal flaring, so that effort into breathing in and exhalation grunting and intercostal retraction. So they're, they're like pulling in to try to breathe in to pull all the air in. So uh, again, we want to do fetal lung maturity tests to prevent that, uh, if at all positive, uh, possible. Uh, the current practice is to perform a phosphatidylglycerol test, um, which is PG test as a screen. And if that's negative or low positive, then do a lecithin to sphingal myelin ratio to, to see, because uh, you know, if there's not enough phosphatidylglycerol, then that means there's not going to be any surfactant there, or not enough anyway. So uh, again, the mother could be given steroids in an effort to mature the fetal lungs and leave the baby in long enough to mature those lungs before the baby is delivered. Uh, next fetal complication is hemolytic disease of the newborn. Sorry about that. Uh, and this is when an RH negative mother has an RH positive child and is sensitized, sensitized to the D antigen. So the mom, RH negative mom, is making anti RH antibodies. The anti RH antibodies can cross over and attack the child. But this usually doesn't happen until the second pregnancy. So the antibody is going to develop during the first pregnancy, maybe the, the delivery of the first baby, first pregnancy, um, but then from then on the mom's synthesized, mom gets pregnant again, those um, are IgG antibodies, and RH antibodies are IgG, meaning they can cross the placenta, meaning they can go attack the second baby if that baby is RH positive. If the baby's RH negative, then there's no, no, no problem, but if the baby's RH positive, then there's a problem. So, um, Usually what happens is for all RH negative moms at 28 weeks with the first pregnancy, anti-D is given to the mom, which is called Rogam, to prevent this sensitization, to neutralize any kind of uh, antibodies that might be produced and to neutral, go ahead and neutralize the D, any D antigen that might be crossing over into the mom from the baby's uh, blood cells. And uh, it is given usually after delivery again, and then with the second, second pregnancy again at 28 weeks. Uh, and then if the mom delivered an RH positive baby for the second time, then after delivery again. And for every pregnancy, it's going to happen that way to prevent the mom from sensitizing too much to the deantigen um, if there's an RH positive baby on board. So what do we do for, uh, again, diagnosis of fetal abnormalities? So um, uh, neural tube defects, we're looking at AFP and reported as multiples of the median. Chromosomal abnormalities, we can do amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling and then um, doing chromosomal karyotypes and stuff. Um, fetal lung maturity, again, we do phosphatidylglycerol and lecithin fingal myelin ratios uh, to detect enough surfactant in the baby's lungs. And that was my last slide. So if you have any questions, let me know. I know it's just a very quick overview of all of this. Um,
But thank you again for your attention and um, let me know if you have any issues. Thank you.